So let's now proceed to our next presentation. Let me introduce to you our next speaker. He is the Vice President of Sales and Customer Support of Call Financial. He manages the day-to-day -day operations of Call Business Centers, its sales division, as well as its customer service division. He also spearheads the Call Investor Seminar Series, the flagship investor education program of Call Financial. In 2018, he was awarded the Best Technical Analyst by the Fund, Manager, Fund Managers Association of the Philippines, making it his fifth year to receive this award. Ladies and gentlemen, let's all welcome Call's Chief Technical Analyst, Mr. Juanis Barredo. Thanks, Brian. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Uh, also, Happy New Year. It was a rainy day again. Just wanted to rain so that you anticipate in the beginning of the year. Also, maybe foreshadowing what the market is actually being putting out for us. Uh, today, this, this type of outlook, I mean, I, I would rather be looking at the market, obviously, in a more buoyant situation, and uh, a lot of people have been quite unhappy with what certain stocks have actually shown. Now, remember, the stock market movements that we've seen will go up and down, sometimes very strongly on the upside, very strongly into the downside. And we're going to have to build that into what we've come to expect in this type of investment. Remember the situation for companies, I think April pointed out, there could be some regulatory risk, there could be natural disasters that can happen, and that all creates volatility. Now, if you were a trader, as compared to being an investor, of course, traders love an opportunity for the market to be very volatile, because every time it moves up or down in a very big way, it presents a short-term opportunity to capitalize on. For the investor, of course, a very big decision has to be made. Do you strap on your seatbelt even more tightly? And believing that the fundamentals that were discussed earlier can be quite robust for you, and that this crisis moment, it may not appear so economically, but because of certain situations that are being presented, might push you to be wondering, am I doing the right thing? I'm taking quite a bit of some losses in, in one side of my portfolio. Or have I structurally put myself in the right position here? Should I realign my basket in what it is that I'm investing in? Now, when you come around to do that, remember, you, you, take, or you have to wear two hats sometimes. Are you a trader or are you an investor? If, of course, you say, I'm an investor, then moments like this will pass for you, right? Because these moments where, where crises come will present such opportunities for you that you might spend such a long time waiting for. And the last thing you want to do is to get that fear, let it take advantage of you, press you down, and submit yourself to that period of inactivity where this opportunity that's actually coming may pass you by. Right? And uh, I think April uh, showed it in Warren Buffett's statement. If the market right now is a very fearful state, what should I be gearing to do? Should I be running away? Or should I be looking to get greedy? Now, I know it's hard to sympathize with that because easy to say, hard to do. When that market's falling down, you're going to feel, you know, the, the air in your lungs just escape. You cannot breathe. It feels so tense. And you said, hindi ko, hindi ko talaga mapindot itong enter button na ito. And that's one of the hardest things to learn in the world of investing. It's, you know, if you don't know how to take risk, you don't know how to make big money. And the stock market will teach you this lesson every day of your life. If you are a trader, your, your realm should be more structured. It is already determined what you're going to do. You know what the rules are. On the way down, you don't buy. When it starts to begin turning around, there you go. And you control your risk very well, and you position yourself and be aware of the opportunities as they come about. Because if you wait too long and you say, oh, the market still looks scary for me, so when will it be? Will you wait for the market to rally 5% before you would say to yourself, okay, I'm ready? Or will you wait for it to climb another 10% and say, okay, I'm ready? Maybe 10, 15% higher, the market might decide to come back down again and, and give you the next opportunity. Hindi pa kayo gumagalaw. Right? I know it's difficult. But nobody ever said this game was easy. But it's there for those who are aware of it, if they understand how to capitalize on those opportunities 
And this crisis of sentiment, let's put it that way, is another opportunity waiting to be capitalized on. Now, when we did this last time, we came out to be able to generate some forecast, and I just put some of my thoughts there initially in the last market outlook. And he said the PSE may again need to nest into another interim correction. He did that. And we expected the zigzag to take place, and unfortunately, it fell lower than what we felt support should be. It went to about 750 to 7,500. And anything more, as I said, anything more than would imply a potential short-medium trend change. So that's what we're dealing with right now. The potential trend change has taken place. And at that time, you're saying, if the market were to rally, it could potentially hit 8,600. It did not. It missed that because the high we hit was 8,216. After that, the market did that. And that showed us the market was doing something very much weaker than what we wanted. It's very clear, year to date, from the beginning of January up to today, the red mark you see there is the performance of the Philippines as against a basket of other uh, indices worldwide. It's very clear the Philippines is lagging. And I think April did, uh, clear, did clarify what those conditions were that presented such an opportunity. In fact, if you were to look again at that emerg uh, emerging market index basket as compared to the Philippines, you can clearly see when it actually decoupled. Decoupled means they don't follow the same track anymore. One's going in one direction, and the other one's going in the opposite direction. If you were to look at the Philippine condition, you will see almost every time the Philippines and the emerging market index, every time it goes up, Philippines follows, it does the same thing on the way down, up, down, up, down, up, down, all the way up to this dotted period here. This was roughly just off the beginning of December, and you know what happened during that time. That's when all this little uh, regulatory risk appeared. Threat of Tal also came up. A lot more trade war things were being talked about. Fortunately, they've, they've encountered some uh, process in there. And I hope in, so, uh, hopefully soon, we get back to resyncing that condition. But I would agree with April, we probably need the one or two of those catalysts you're talking about to come inside to be able to give people more confidence to come back. In the meantime, prepare for more volatility. My worry is that the Philippine index technically is not looking so nice as of yet, all right? There's a pattern in there called a head and shoulders pattern, which technically a lot of people understand is supposed to be a very threatening or imposing pattern. It's a very bearish one. It shows you a trend that's been going up, finally going sideways, and possibly trending down. And the key point inside that picture is you would see this neckline condition right here, and that's roughly within that range of 75 to 74, 75. If that index breaks that and stays below it for a day or a week or more, then we'll probably see acceleration into the way down. If you look at the bigger chart on the right side, this is it, since the bull market began back in 2009, you will see the picture in there suggesting that overall the market's still in an upward moving bias. Despite this pattern that you see here, if you look at that, that's this little small consolidation here on this end. And there is a little bit of room for it to come down without it breaking the trend as of yet. So I will sound a warning bell in case something more than anticipated will come into place. But as of now, right now, we just have to understand how bad can this go in case it decides to, and what should I do if such a scenario takes place? So in order for do, we'll look at support structures for us to see where this particular market may actually come down to. On the left, you would see the chart of the PSEI index. On the right, looking almost similar to it, is a chart of the MSCI Philippines Index, which trades in, in the United States. And you would see they're pretty much almost the same. They're both in pretty much the same condition, standing over critical areas of support, as you see the baselines here of the neckline, and also a similar one over here. And as long as the index stays above that, we still have that, a, a good chance for the market to rally well. And that's what we're watching out very carefully. So in the Philippines, that's roughly between 7.5 to 7.4. And in the US, in terms of the MSCI index, that's between $32 and about $31.70. So this is what we're watching out for. Now, I know if that were to break, it may raise a lot of, of course, emotion coming to way. And you might say, oh no, anong mangyayari ngayon? Now, I know that looks quite threatening, but one thing I want you to see First, from these two charts is the decline that you're looking at did not begin here where it is right now. 
Remember, the decline started from up here, and so did it also from the other, in, the other index from this top. So quite a bit of a downside has already been shown before that support is being threatened. That normally means that if a support break would come, there's a very strong chance that a rebound will come in first and that hindi lang tuloy today that that one thing will go down. Okay, so don't be that scared if support were to break. There will be a rally and you can use uh, take advantage of that. In fact, it's possible that could even start. So that 7.5 to 7.475 is a critical zone. If we want this market to rally well, we need that support to hold. Second, we need 7,900 to break. That will tell us that it can push itself out of that head and shoulder threat and allow the index more room to be able to recover and may even present a short-term rally all the way to 8,200 or 8.4 if that support structure can hold and that resistance structure can break. If not, then we are going to have to be able to make adjustments to be able to prepare for a, a, a not-so-rosy picture into an extremely short term where it's possible the index can back off closer to that, maybe 7473 or that 7280 as I put it there, and maybe if things go on a bear case scenario, 6800 range. And so that's what we're going to have to be able to prepare ourselves for this time around. How bearish is the market anyway? So I put some of these facts together just to give you a sense of that. 44 of all the stocks taken from a listed 257 active issues today, 44 of those stocks are currently trading below all their moving averages. 160 of those, oh, sorry, 44 are trading above their moving averages, and 106 of them are all trading below. And that suggests that many of those 160 plus issues are downtrending already. Again, they're not beginning to go down, they have been going down. That's the only way they'd be standing below those moving averages. The, ones in, the number in parentheses is the index stocks. So only four index stocks are trading above their moving averages. I'm talking about their 50, 100, and 200 day. And there are 21 of them, remember there's only 30 index stocks, 21 of them are all below their moving averages. If you want to know which are those four strong ones, well, the four issues are ICTS, Robinsons, Robinsons Retail, and Universal Rubina Corporation. So technically, they're the four strongest stocks in the index lineup. Second factoid. Now, only six stocks of the entire Philippine universe is close to making a 52-week high. 52 weeks is one year. And 27 of them are actually making, or close to making, 52-week lows. Again, showing you that the ratios are not really very uh, good on the bullish side. Third stat, 19 issues are on the overbought side, and 25 of them are on the oversold side. Although that may not just be a lot, I mean, it's very rare that you get so many going into an oversold condition at the same time. Ratio-wise, downtrends versus uptrends in the entire market, you've got Four issues for every one climbing. Four issues going down, one trending, trending up. Index stock decliners were advances, five is to one. Right? So that tells you how lopsided declines have been. 52-week lows versus 52-week highs, four is to one. And of course, issues trading out near the oversold levels is about 10% of the overall market is there already. So how do we put all these stats uh, together and how do we take advantage of this? So, the first question you look at when you look at all those bear, seemingly bearish conditions, you might ask, with all those signals, are we in a bear market? In technical analysis, we actually have a very definite definition on that to tell you whether we are in a bearish mode or not. If the index falls below 20% of its high, then we are considered to be in a bear market. Second is we have to stay below it for more than two or three months before that can actually be confirmed. If you look at the picture I have here on the chart, we've actually broken that 20% level earlier, right here and right here, but it didn't stay there for more than three months. It actually rallied back and your index was back here. And with what you've seen with the index so far, we're now standing here, we're about 17% below that, that, that previous high. So we cannot tell you we are in a bear market yet, according to the definition of what a bear market is. But please look at this. So what I did is I looked at all the index stocks, put them all together. I want to measure how far they were 
from the top that they've made either a year ago, two years ago, or some of them even three years ago. And when I looked at numbers, I myself were quite surprised because I could see from that era that 76% of them all, of all those index stocks, were actually more than 20% from their highs already. In fact, some of them, you can see some of those issues there on the left. You're talking about the range of AEV, Telephone, GTCAP, Semirara, MPI, LTG, DMC, are trading between 30 to 40% lower than their high. Now, you might say, my God, what's going on? And my mind is not thinking that, or my mind is thinking, ah, okay, that's how much of a decline has already taken place. And I'm not looking forward for that falling so, so much more. Of course, if, uh, I might eat my words if more regulatory risk comes out. <laughs> but what I'm saying is a lot of the selling has already been done. And that, to me, is a very important stat because when you look at all this happening into quality issues like this, the market is giving that sense that you've thrown in a lot in the pot in terms of that selling. And to me, that could be that opportunity that we've been waiting for. Now, into the conditions that you're looking at in terms of people normally ask me, where are we standing on, a, on an Elliott wave uh, condition? Well, looking at it in a little bit more of a bigger picture, We've gone through a corrective mode, and my, my real concern is the last rally we had, which is this rally here, back from November last year, uh, 2018, all the way to the high here at about 8.3 or 8.4, 8 in that range, uh, showed a much lower high than the high that we've come through in this area here. And that could mean the potential trend change is taking place on a bigger picture. Because of that, that could mean that the very, very accelerated view we've seen since 2009 might be slowing down and something wider on a consolidation band might be up ahead. But it could be well that we've been more than halfway the distance down into what is known as a sea wave, and that potentially this could come into a conclusion sometime, I feel, into the next six months. And if that happens, then the opportunity for the market to rally is going to come and if you are not looking at that opportunity, then you might miss the boat in this particular case. That doesn't mean that I want you to go out there and be aggressive and buy and buy and buy. You still have to do this because I feel in the short term, you're still going to get some choppiness, volatility. Things can still happen. Uh, there still have considerations to happen. And I will point out some of that in a little while so you can also anticipate what to do during that condition. But you already, as of this early, you should already be watchful of these opportunities. Because if your mind's not prepared to take an opportunity, it will pass you by. And so, what scenarios do I feel can happen here? So let's start with a more bullish scenario. In a more bullish scenario, this is what I wish would happen, okay? So, I wish the index would break support just to throw some of weak hands out of the market, but not so much because I don't want it to scare everybody. And I want it to be able to fall on just a bit, but to rally relatively fast. Who knows, maybe we just felt that. But if you can d do this type of movement, the market will rally, it will come back and try to retest the low it's made. If it holds at that base and rallies again, the next rally will be wider. And then you will see something a little bit, might take a lot of people out of, of uh, anticipating this because no one is anticipating the market to rally right away. And then you will get a little bit more of an escalated advance, maybe hitting back ranges going back to the top end, and I'll give you those estimated ranges into the next slide. But if that doesn't happen, I'm more, I'm more leaning on this type of situation happening. This is what, uh, of course, my, our chairman likes to call a square root phenomenon. So if you understand what a square root formation looks like, it's like a drop like this, a rebound, and then it flattens off for a while before potentially a breakout situation can come in. And that particular situation, I think, is more likely for our market because, like I said, it will give us the time necessary to wait for things to happen and to improve, and hopefully those catalysts April talked about can actually surface. Now. I have to, again, come out with a third scenario. Now, again, I'm going to put a very low band into this, but potentially this is it. If that indeed is a head and shoulders pattern, it's telling me that there's still this overhang of supply that is existing, and that the potential for the market to come down may be quite a sizable amount. 
Normally, we measure the, the, the height of that pattern and project it downwards to try to get an assessment. <coughs> so if you see what we have here, the index, if a worst case scenario would come, would drop, rally, drop again, make a lower low, lower high, and eventually find itself trying to create a base closer to the previous low we have here, which is closer to the 6869 level. And then you will see a strong rally that will come. That will be your clue. When that strong rally comes, I hope that you guys are all ready, that that is the first trigger for the market to make a base. Because it shows the first act of willingness and confidence in the market to come back inside. But that may not be the first buying opportunity. After that, the market will come back down. It will retest that low and hopefully make a higher low. And after that higher low is made, that is the buying opportunity that many of you guys can be more aggressive on. If you want to buy the first rally, you can put in or inject a small position first. Because remember, you're still buying a stock that's in a downtrend and has not confirmed its turnaround. And that volatility will come in in due time. Now, once that thing is over, of course, then you can be more aggressive. I think the market would have expressed the fullness of its selling, and the market will be more right to be able to climb. So these would be the three scenarios that, that you should be watchful of, and I really hope the first one is the one that come in, but I only put a 30% possibility of that. I put a greater possibility, 50% into the blue one, and I put a 20% possibility, of course, of a worst-case scenario manifesting. Now, why do I think the first one can happen? Well, like I suggested, a lot of the bearish items have already been thrown in. <coughs> I think April already pushed that out. Two, I counted about 10.3 billion in foreign outflows in, in the last 30 days alone. That's a huge amount of selling. Even when the market was trading between four to six billion every day. And so that means that's quite a bit of exiting that took place. So that's out of the market already, and that cannot disturb us anymore because those sellers are no longer there. And three, we're starting to see oversold levels being hit by even blue chip stocks. And that alone is already telling us the market's being pressed. Right? You can say, pinigamo na talagang husto yan. And that's why the ability for it to rebound may be around the corner. And we have to be very much watchful of that. So, assuming the three scenarios, and let's say that the 7473 area is the lowest the market does, and then the market rebound will come, the rally would be between a range of 7.8 to about 8,030. If it falls deeper and hits 7,000, the rally will be between 7.5 to about 7,008 or 7,009. And if a worst case scenario brings it down to 6,800, the recovery that will come up will have to be between 7.4 and maybe 7.6, at least initially. And we'll see later, maybe in the second half, we can make an adjustment into the course of the activity that we will see. So what do we want the market to show? Well, we want the market to base before we obviously become more aggressive. If some of you feel the valuations are good, inject a small position, like I said, but allow the technicals to be able to confirm your suspicion that the market does not want to fall down anymore. I put a picture of URC here on the right side. If you can see what I want you to, to see here is, as prices are heading down, a typical thing you will see is prices will come down, make lower lows, <coughs> and the first test of that is this one where instead of going back lower, it finally broke out of its downtrend line or even resistance line and actually shot up quite strongly. This is an example of a reversal prospect and should be the focus of what you want to see in other stocks to give you that confidence that this is not going down anymore and that more likely a wider rally is coming into place. So try to be able to look for this. Of course, good volume, insider buying. Downtrend line breaks are also good keys that things are turning around. The double bottoms, which I very much uh, want to see. And if you want, on a technical basis, either 50 or 100 day moving averages are breaking on the way up. And that should all contribute to the signs that the, the basing sign for your stock is very much in play. Now, just on the externals, I just want to be able to talk a little bit about the other markets and see what influence we will see from there. My position is that U.S. is stretched and that it may be due for a correction. Bonds are telling me that that's most likely going to happen. The dollar is still in a downtrend, but it's rallying near the high range. I will show that to you in a while. Gold has also been on, a, on fire and, and telling you something is going on other than usual. <coughs> Sorry. And <clears throat> the peso dollar uh, it has made a pit stop from its firming situation. And there might be, as they say, because of the deficit, there might be a bit of a rally that might come into the peso dollar. So let's quickly look at it. 
So why am I concerned with the S&P? Very strong market, very bullish situation, but prices have been on an upward tear. And given that type of condition, it remains overbought, and there might be the ability for it to correct. I don't think it's going to finish the uptrend. It just needs to correct. When the U.S. normally corrects, it takes other markets down along with it, and that's why I'm concerned. The U.S. bond market is telling me that that potential correction may come because I can already see a breakout taking place in the U.S. 10-year bond telling me that people are shifting from the riskier asset being equities and buying the safety net of bonds. And since I can see the breakout condition here, I can see that movement, and that's why there's a potential for the U.S. to correct even sooner. In terms of the dollar, the dollar is in a downtrend, as you see there, but it's now trading near the higher on the range, so I would anticipate that the dollar might feel some pressure pretty soon. So if you're looking to buy the dollars, uh, maybe uh, as they were talking about earlier in the Philippines, it might be a good idea, but so far there might be some, uh, you know, some counter flows that might, if the dollar in the U.S. manages to be able to continue its down move. Gold prices have been very strong. It broke out uh, late uh, in last year, and the ability for it to be able to continue, I think, is still in place. So it was just overbought. It may need to wind up a little bit more, but in the last few days, I saw gold attempt to be able to rally. Gold, I think, is rallying because either it's thinking the gold, uh, that the dollar might get softer or that a potential threat from inflation might be around. And we all let the fundamentalists uh, handle the, the reasons for it. But right now, the gold play is still very much intact. But I think after a bit of a rally, you'll still see a consolidation here. Now, the threats from oil, I think, have been put down. Of course, that issue that happened with Iran recently spiked gold, uh, oil prices up and went as high to about almost $64. And it actually crossed the boundary that I was anticipating would probably hold. But it quickly moved back in. So I think quite confident that oil will stay within a set range, and that range will be closer to 52-51 support. High band of oil will be closer to 63. So if you're looking at this generating an inflationary scare, I don't think so. I think you will see oil just trade within this big band. And finally, the Philippine peso. You're looking at this when I say it's a pit stopping because you can see the downtrend in the peso dollar rate. That means that the, the peso has actually been getting stronger against the U.S. dollar. But recently, you've seen that it's actually started creating a pattern or a consolidation bottom there. And there is a potential for it to make a recovery. <coughs> I've been hearing the 53, 54 for a couple of months now, but I have not seen prices reflected as of yet. So it doesn't seem to get spooked. But I think June earlier said that the impact may still be fully felt by the third quarter. So it's still quite possible that maybe it's collecting its base. But of what I see, 52 seems to be a heavy resistance for it to break. So it might just stop maybe under what they're anticipating, something closer to that in a, in a particular rally. Now, what do I do in the Philippine condition? In the Philippine condition, I would only look for two types of trading opportunities. The first I would call looking for stocks and trying to buy them because they're strong and they've shown you trend resilience. What that means is you either have a strong upward moving situation or maybe gradually moving sideways. And what you want to do is buy it at the low end of the range, okay? Because it may not fall as deep as what you think it may. They're called resilient stocks for a reason. It's because they're trying to resist falling down and if you're trying to wonder why, it's really because of the advent of indexing, of which I think Dino presented and April talked about earlier. Because people who buy an index fund will automatically have that flow come into these stocks. <coughs> Sorry, that's the reason for why you're seeing that. So let's look at BDO, for example. If you notice, most of the SM stocks have been quite resilient. So if you're looking at a BDO, it's been actually going into an uptrend. Right now, it's built into a sideways movement. So what do you want to do if you want to take a position? I can't tell you it's completely cheap right now, but on the technical side, I would say that a range between the blue line here or the trend line here would be a more optimum area to look for a potential buy-in for BDO. And you hold on to it and keep that as a structural core for your position. The other trading opportunity you'll get are from issues that have been, of course, have capsized because of regulatory risk or issues that could be caused by natural calamity. And because of that, you would see stocks like this go all the way back down quite heavily. So GT Cup, downtrending situation, but now all the way at the bottom end of the range. 
So this is called mean reversion if you take a trade like this. All it means is this is where the stock is going down, and it's supposed to follow this angle, but now your stock is way down here. And the difference between where you are down here to where it should be is what you're going to try to take advantage of, a rally from here to this point here. So if you look back into <clears throat> your picture in GTCAP, the trade here for mean reversion, which means let it go back to where it should be, would be to buy it closer to the lower end of this range for a potential target closer to the high band of this, which is somewhere here or here. And you're going to get a lot of these types of opportunities into the market. So this is what I did. I know you guys normally ask me one by one about it, so I just prepared one slide so you guys can take a picture, take this home. Anyway, we'll send this to you. But this is the Codigo here. I color-coded it for you. The green horizontal lines will show you the, all, the, all those index stocks that are resilient, okay? generally holding sideways to up. And I put some resistance and support areas there so you can get a range of what the high band and low band of the ranges should be, so you can take that to your advantage. The blue colored prices are issues that are currently in consolidation. <coughs> it's very hard to trade those stocks. <coughs> Sorry. If you want to do that, remember again, low band, high band only. Don't anticipate anything out of the band. Okay? But if you're going for mean reversion, the orange ones, that means these are issues that have fallen down quite steeply already. And that you're just waiting for them to turn, and then it may make a counter move that may be a, give you a better opportunity than buying, of course, the more resilient stocks. So what's, what is in return for that? Yes, you might have more upside, but it will generate more choppiness along the way. And I don't know if you guys can take the heat of that type of movement. So if you're, depending on your personality, if you're more long-term in your approach, I would suggest you go ahead and buy their more resilient stocks. I don't think you're going to anticipate a heart attack in moments from them. All right? Or you could try the ones in blue, but just make sure that if the lower ends break, you know what can happen. That can crack and that could still slide. So maybe put protective stops in there. If you are a trader, you probably want to look for mean reversions because this is where upsides become more pronounced for you. And if you buy them, you simply look at the last low it made and put a protective stop there, and you gun for the potential next resistance targets that you have. So why only index stocks in my list? I think Dino uh, told you earlier, the reason that indexing becomes very important now is because fund flows goes there. When you have climates like this that markets are still uneasy, the last thing and most dangerous place you want is to stay in a stock that is illiquid, stocks that don't have any value. I know April showed you a few stocks to be able to pick, but let me just cite one as an example. Yes, good quality fundamentally. The problem trading the stock is very difficult. CNPF. So somebody said, wow, one is CNPF climbed up almost 3% yesterday. I said, yes, that's correct. It traded with less than 30,000 pesos worth of activity. Less than 30,000 pesos worth for yesterday that contributed to almost a 3% move. I mean, I, that cannot be put into action. If I had, let's say, 50,000, 100,000, 1 million pesos or, or more, I can't even go in and out of that stock if I really do want to. So please, liquidity is very important, especially in a market that's like this. Because if that stock were to correct and their liquidity runs away, at hindi kayo makabenta, ano gagawa ninyo? Buy and buy more. <laughs> and you will be a perpetual investor, not by choice, by situation. Kasi hindi nyo At this area, capital is key. You're waiting for an opportunity. The last thing you want to do is have all your money locked up away. You must have some cash ready. Because if you don't have cash ready, how are you going to take advantage of the opportunity? And this is something that you build into your structure. So keep your little bit of a war chest ready because these opportunities are getting ready to show you, if not already. You have to learn how to be able to take advantages. Don't let fear grab you and keep you pinned down. Because like I always tell you at the end of my talk, remember, scared money will never make money. So in summary, oops. So the PSE may try to rebound, but yet may feel pressure because it looks like the downtrend may not be finished. Uh, we do still have some concerns existing. 
I will think that a wider rally will come in after this full C wave effect is taking place. Although there will be some rally that some traders can come around to be able to do right now. We will await for this major low because it's the only way I can tell you what the potential upside of the market is. Anyway, I gave you a gauge already of what to use. In terms of individual stocks, again, the basing process is very important here. I gave you the sample of URC to be able to use. Uh, hopefully, issues like uh, the stronger ones don't have to go through that process, so you stay with the stronger ones, that might be good. And remember, index names and, and liquid stocks are what you have to have in your portfolio today. Don't be being too aggressive on the risk side because that could prove to be injurious. It will lock your money up. It will prevent you from acting when opportunities come, and that's not what you want here. You want the ability to flex so that opportunities can be taken advantage of, and that is the most important thing you have. And just remember, the U.S. has not corrected yet and may decide to do so. That might inject some volatility into a market that may, again, give you that opportunity to look into the market. So I leave you again also with another quote, for, also for Warren Buffett, but this time he says, never test the depths of a river with both of your feet. And again, all that means is, again, if you want to be able to test yourself or get your market condition because you think the market's heading in the low, put in a small size. It doesn't have to be everything. Because if you make a mistake and you put both your feet in that river and you, you miscalculate the low, you will end up just sinking along to the depths. And so take this one step at a time. The opportunity is there. It may be not right now, but it might be in the next one or two months. So be prepared for that activity. So with that, thank you very much.